Okay. So <clears throat> we're going to go through, I sent out uh, five um, uh, slides, um, which will con constitute today's lecture. I also sent out some papers that uh, cover uh, this material. And I do strongly suggest that after today's lecture, you read those papers. Um, I think most of them are pretty self-contained, basic, um, but it, they cover the details of uh, the basic ideas um, in a much more in a expansive way than um, I can hear today. So, now, what we talked last week about discrete state dynamic programming. Uh, now, this is, those are, discrete states are sometimes appropriate, sometimes they're just used to approximate uh, states that were really more naturally to be continuous. So uh, today we're going to start talking about how to do continuous state dynamic programming. Now, uh, here is uh, the basic Bellman equation, and it's it's really what I'm representing here is the T operator. That basically the T operator um, basically takes tomorrow's value function or the old value function if you're doing um, value function iteration. You take a value function that represents the future value, and then you construct today's value function, v nu. And this then defines the T operator. Um, now, one approach to, when you have continuous states is to discretize those states. That's commonly done However, it's um, in many cases uh, quite inefficient, uh, given what if given uh, what you want to approximate. In many cases, for example, if you're doing a life cycle uh, model and you discretize wealth, well, then that's uh, and let's say your unit of time is a month. Well, then your increments in wealth. Has to be has to correspond to uh, consumption during a month, and so your typically your consumption is a small fraction of total wealth, and so if you want to model flexibility in choosing consumption, you have to have a lot of uh, fine discretization of of the wealth state variable. So um, the we really would prefer doing um, continuous states explicitly. Now, also the point I make about discretization, discretization essentially replaces, approximates the value function with a step function. Um, it does not do piecewise linear interpolation. It's basically approximating the value function with a step function. Now, approximation theory, as we've seen, um, whether you're doing um, regressions and, or splines or whatever, can come up with much better ways to approximate uh, continuous value functions. So what we need to do is to find a good approximation for value functions. Um, and then also once we have a family of value function approximations specified, uh, we then have to focus on finding the parameters of the approximations. So what we do is we, we choose some functional form, I call V hat, uh, for the value function. So, um, so this is a functional form where X is a variable and then A is a vector of coefficients. Now, what could that be? Well, this, um, this could, and also you, you choose a, a set, a finite set of states to go with the approximation. Now, 
what could this be? Well, um, oh, my indentation's off a bit. Anyway, examples of this could be, you could, you could have the value function be represented as a sum of polynomials or some kind of polynomial. And then the coefficients of the powers of the polynomial would be in little a. Or you could have uh, the function approximation here be um, a sum of Chebyshev polynomials or some other from some other family of orthogonal polynomials. And then the what is what are the states x then? Well, this the x the states x should be some set of points that are good for using for approximation purposes given the underlying approximation. So for example, um, if you'd had splines and you have some coefficients, it's naturally use uniform nodes. Or actually sometimes in economics, what you do is you have the nodes not be uniform, but uniform in the log. Anyway, you're pretty flexible there. Now, rational function is an, um, also another possibility, neural networks. These are all possibilities that fit into this general family, general concept of a parameterized approximation, a parameterized family of functions to approximate the value function. So what we wanna do is find some coefficients such that the resulting approximation v hat x with coefficients a approximately solves the Bellman equation. Now, the key, th okay, once we have solved the Bellman equation, or the, this, so, no, sorry, once we have given an approximation scheme for the value function, we now want to consider how the T operator operates on the approximation. So now in the computer, what you're trying to do is uh, you, the, the um, oh, actually, this should be TV hat. So now what you're trying to do is, given that uh, you replaced um, the future value function with some approximation, then what you want to do is compute the, the, the image under T. Um, but there still is a problem that computers can't map functions to functions. So we must instead map approximations of the value function to another approximation of the value function. And now, by the way, we also have to approximate the T operator itself. Because notice that the T operator itself is, is a, an integral. And so this integration, this, which I write integration here, but it's an expectation. This um, expectation is itself uh, an infinitistic object because you're trying to integrate over a possibly infinite set collection of points. So you have to approximate the T operator. So, um, so for each xj, T v hat is defined by this. Um, but we need to approximate T with uh, a T hat operator. And how is that done? There's two things within the T operator that has to be done numerically. The, the T operator has to e e evaluate this expectation of the value tomorrow, condition on state today and um, choice of control today. And that is always expressed as an integral. Um, and so then um, we choose, yeah. okay, then the x plus here is a function of, of g, remember, um, tomorrow state is a function g of today's state, today's control, and then also with some noise. So typically then you have to integrate against the, the density of the noise. Um, so now here's your integrand, and then here's your density. So then you have to find some integration formula consistent with the density 
that then can be um, efficiently approximate this integral. And so those formulas, as we saw in the quadrature lecture, um, have the form of choosing some uh, weights and then also some particular points in the, you're integrating over epsilon, so you have a particular finite number of epsilons and weights, and then you just take the finite sum. So the infinitistic operation of integration here is then approximated by this finite sum. Okay, so now we have everything can be, uh, can be th this can be done on a computer. So this objective function for the, um, the maximization step is co co computable. But now what we have to do is that we have to solve this optimization problem, the maximization step, is we're given a state xj today and given your finitistic approximation of this integral, you now have to maximize, um, chose it, find the u that maximizes this inter integral, or maximizes this sum. So that's another numerical step. And so once you have now done um, this optimization problem for each xi in your set of uh, approximation nodes, uh, then um, you have basically data. You have the, the value at the ith node and the ith node itself. And so what you want to do is then find some coefficients A such that v hat x fits this data. So that's what, that's what we have to do. And so then the, here's an overview of what's going on. Given some coefficients, you have an approximation for tomorrow's value function. That then via this optimization and uh, numerical integration step gives you new data for today's value function and then you find some new coefficients that represents the new value function or today's. Now, by the way, uh, some people will refer to this kind of approach as discretizing uh, the state, but no, that's a very bad uh, choice of words. The, the, we use a, we, use a finite number of nodes to, to construct the data, but there's no limitation on what the state can be in, um, in any part of this problem. When you discretize the state space, uh, then yes, you're forcing um, the choices to always put you on one of a finite set of of state various points. But no, nothing in what we do um, uh, adjusts that. So basically, uh, you can, when you're doing the maximization, you can choose any little u which was gonna affect where the x plus is tomorrow. And uh, so you're not discretizing the state space. What you're doing is just evaluating the unknown value function of today and doing it at a appropriately chosen set of points compatible with your approximation scheme that will then give you the information you can have um, to, to come up with a good approximation. Also, by the way, the epsilons here, we haven't discretized the epsilon at all. We've, what we've done is we have replace this integral with an integration formula. Um, and again, we haven't really discretized the epsilons. So th this is not another kind of discretization. Now, here is where the practical things come up. Now, you have synergies across this. 
So, you know, in the maximization step, you're going to have to approximately maximize um, this, this sum, and then this is replaced by this finite sum here. So now, when you optimize respect to little u, uh, you would like the, this part of the sum to be continuous in little u. Now, now, of course, little u is going to affect tomorrow's state. So let's say that that's a continuous um, dependence. But then in order for <coughs> this whole thing to depend continuously on u, b hat has to depend continuously on its argument. So what you, if you don't have a continuous representation of approximation of V, then this optimization problem is not gonna be, well, okay. Let's say you have a continuous approximation. Let's say if you have it, if it's a piecewise linear approximation, which is not differentiable, then you're trying to, op, you're trying to solve a maximization problem here where the objective function is not differentiable. So what you really want to do is to make sure that your value function is sufficiently smooth so that the objective function in the maximization step is also smooth. And then that allows you to use very efficient optimization methods such as Newton's method. Also, a smooth interpolation will allow you to come up with a very efficient quadrature rule. So everything here is, is very important in, for determining what kind of speed you're going to get. And if you do a bad job um, on these steps, you're going to have a very slow algorithm. So here, the objective is to solve the Bellman equation. And now I'm thinking of the infinite horizon autonomous problem. Uh, choose, a choose a functional form and approximation grid. And these two things have to be compatible. Um, and then you make some initial guess. And then you, uh, at each of the XJ nodes, you solve the maximization problem and then you collect the data, and now we come up with coefficients for the new value function. Uh, one thing I'll point out to you is that uh, this step is obviously parallelizable because uh, for different xj's, uh, you have a different optimization problem, and all of the x the, and the xj individual xj problems do not interact because you're always using tomorrow's value function. Uh, so in value function iteration, this can all be done in parallel and can be done uh, massively parallel. Um, in a paper of, of mine that came out and, and with Young Yang that came out in, um, in this last December in JPE, uh, the number of XJ nodes was in the millions and, uh, but, you know, we could solve that because we had, let's say up to like 80,000 cores that we could parallelize these jobs over. So this is ideal for massive parallelization. Now, um, here's the thing you have to keep in mind. The T operator is a contraction mapping. It is also a monotonic mapping. You increase the V on the right-hand side, you get a bigger V on the left-hand side. The T hat approximation that you defined just by following what I did before may not be a contraction mapping. It may not be monotonic. Um, now, here's the problem. And I think you should, we saw this a bit um, in the approximation lecture that even if your data is monotone increasing, when you interpolate the data, you may not 
find a curve that is monotonically increasing. Even if your data is concave, uh, when you interpolate or even do a regression, the approximation may not be concave. See, remember that in all, in all of the approximation stuff we did, the goal was to find a curve that goes through a set of points or a cloud of points and, and represents that cloud or set of points. And it doesn't care about preserving properties such as monotonicity or concavity. You haven't told it anything about that. You've just said, make sure that the errors are as small as possible in some uh, often in a quadratic norm. So what can happen here is that uh, shape problems can arise and kill you. Now, we'll get back to the shape problems. Now, um, by the way, there is a policy a function, a policy iteration approach also to dynamic programming with in Infinite Horizon. Um, I will say that um, uh, the simple version of this does not do well. There is a more sophisticated version that we may talk about later. I'm just saying that you can, the policy iteration approach can be uh, represented and considered in the same context. So now disc discretization methods are easy to implement. Also, they are numerically stable because when you have, when you've discretized a state space, if the value function going into the T operator is concave and monotonically increasing, it will be also coming out if you have an underlying concave problem. Um, and also you can accelerate at the prop. We talked about various accelerations. The problem is that they're very inefficient approximations. And so particularly when you go into multidimensional problems, um, discretization is not at all um, practical. Um, now with continuous approximation methods, you now can exploit smoothness in the problems, but you have numerical instability issues to deal with. So that's an overview of, of what we're doing. Um, any, uh, I've got the chat pad up here. Any, any questions, any comments at this point? Now, um, I have here some Mathematica notebooks that will show you um, some, something. By the way, um, uh, at, um, later on this week, I'll be sending out problems for the next problem set. By the way, some of those problems will be to um, do in some in your one of your languages, Python, MATLAB, excuse me, whatever, uh, what I do in these Mathematica notebooks. Now, we're going to look at the same old um, boring discrete excuse me, your discrete time growth model. We're going to assume that the production function is, um, is the Cobb-Douglas production function. And also we're gonna choose this uh, capital A to be um, this function of the alpha and the discount factor parameters so that the steady state is one. Now, by the way, I am not going to use the Cobb-Douglas production function um, in the computer code. Exactly. Why? Because if I, if for some reason the computer wants to evaluate K at a negative K, that's going to blow up. So instead, what I do is I, um, I compute the Taylor series approximation around some small value of K here is the 0 0.01 in this case and do a quadratic approximation and then basically say that um, the F of K, the F that I'm going to use in the computational version here 
is if k is less than 0.01, I will use the Taylor series approximation. Otherwise, I use the one we really are trying to approximate. And so this now is a function that is globally defined. And by the way, we're not going to spend much, we're not, the, we're not going to really look at the problem down where the capital stock is less than 0.01. That's not of terrible interest to us. However, we have to worry about the computer in its searching around for a solution doing something like that, that trying to guess that K could be negative. Same thing here for the utility function. I want to say the log utility, but I again, re for con small consumption, I replace it with the Taylor series approximation. Um, and then, but for consumption above a small amount, I then use the log utility function. So um, this is um, how we proceed. Now, um, now, by the way, this has a closed form solution. Oh, by the way, the, the parameters here, alpha is capital share, beta is uh, the discount factor and the utility. And so then there is a solution to the dynamic programming problem in closed form. Here's the true solution. Um, and then here's also the, the true consumption policy. Um, and um, okay, so I didn't get the, it didn't get plotted, but that, it doesn't matter. It's a simple function. Now, okay, I've defined the problem. Uh, utility function, production function, and also I've rigged it up so that the steady state is equal to one. The capital stock, steady state capital stock is one. So now I have to choose a domain over which I'm going to solve the dynamic programming problem. Now, I better include the steady state in that domain. Otherwise, uh, it's, uh, things aren't going to go well. Um, now, you might say, well, why don't you choose the domain zero to infinity? Well, I don't like doing things over a half infinite interval uh, if I don't have to. Uh, now, approximating a function over a half infinite interval is challenging. You could use Gauss uh, Laguerre um, uh, polynomials, but but it's far better to solve this problem over a compact domain. And by the way, for um, for any practical, real world example, this for this optimal growth model, the the economy is going to live on a compact domain. There is some uh, level of capital stock that will never be achieved. Um, that you may, may, may for some for some production functions, even if you save zero every period, and you just reinvest the capital stock. If there's depreciation, the depreciation is going to drag you down. So choose a compact domain um, such that the problem will stay in that compact domain. And in this optimal growth model, we know that um, any closed interval around the steady state is going to be um, a domain that can that the weather problem will stay. And so we choose a 0.2 to 1.5. Now I'm going to choose approximation nodes, and I'm going to choose a uniform set of nodes um, between 14 nodes uniformly spread between uh, 0.2 and 1.5. By the way, uh, basically the step size here, the delta K step size is 0.1. So it's gonna be 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, blah, 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 et cetera, um, are the 14 points. And now we're gonna use um, ordinary polynomial for the basis of, a, of our approximation. Okay, now we're gonna treat, this is an infinite horizon problem. We're going to start with initial guess for the value function, and then we just iterate backwards. And here's some uh, initial guess for the value function. Now, uh, there's two pieces here to think about that, why I did it. Now, if we know that the steady state is at one, the initial guess should also 
uh, be consistent with that. And so basically the initial guess here um, is, is, a, is a concave quadratic which, with a max at one. So basically by having a, um, a guess for the value function which wants, which wants to pull the state, the state to one, you're gonna have something that respects the dynamic and is consistent with the dynamics of the underlying problem. Um, then why did I put in this, I computed C min, this is the absolute minimum amount of consumption that you could sustain forever. So suppose you're at K min, and then you have this output, and you save K min, and then the rest, um, so you can have K min tomorrow, and then the rest is your consumption. This is kind of like a minimum floor on consumption and utility, and then so you, you act as if um, you scale this problem additively um, by adding on this um, uh, utility of semen discounted um, into the infinite future. So anyway, that's, uh, that gives you something that um, is sensible in many ways. Now here's the Bellman operator. The Bellman operator says given some point X for today's state, I can compute the value function at that state. And then this is the operator that the procedure that does it. What you want to do is define your objective function. And in this case, it's U of C plus beta times value function at um, F of X minus C. And then here you're telling it the initial guess is the steady state consumption. I'm just saying six digit accuracy is enough here. Um, and then this basically um, says uh, pull up the, what happens here is that this operator find maximum will send, give you two uh, numbers. Basically the first number will be the value. The second number will be the solution. So we just want the value here. And so then um, we're going to start by setting the value function equal to the initial value function. And then we um, create a table. So basically, um, nodes, um, by the way, this double left bracket, I double right bracket, I should change that to basically a subscript because that's what it really is, is the ith subscript. Um, and so basically, for each of these nodes, you compute the new value at that node and put it in a table. And now here, here I um, have plotted out the results. Well, that looks kind of nice, nice in monotone increasing and concave. Um, now what I'm going to do is compute the new value function. So now what I'm going to do is try to find a, I think it's a degree five polynomial that approximates those points, uh, degree four polynomial. So here's the data, here's the, uh, the X values and here's the V values. Here's the basis functions. And then um, this fit new values powers command is Mathematica's version of saying, okay, here's your data. Um, and then here's your basis function powers, the powers of X. And this, this is a table of X's and V's. And now do a regression uh, with the variable X. Um, and then the, that, that comes out with creating a function value of X. And now let's plot it. Basically, uh, this is the initial, the initial guess. And now this is iteration number one's value function. Now notice that the initial guess was not a monotonically um, increasing function. And that's fine here. What's important about the um, initial value is that it pushes the dynamics in the right way. So yes, the fact that the value function, the initial guess maximize as a maximum at one means that there's, it's, it's going to want to push the state towards one. That's important to maintain the uh, stability of all of this. Um, the other fact is that it's concave and that's important. Um, and so what happens here is that um, it, it maintains a concavity, 
Uh, and then it becomes monotone because basically it figures out that, well, we don't want to go there. The high capital sucks anyway. Now what I'm going to do is define a, a script. So VFI is what it does is it takes whatever the current value function is, the current function that's called v val x, and then uh, does all these procedures. We've done iteration one, and so now we iterate. Here's iteration two. Now notice, um, I, okay. So there's iteration two, and there's three. Notice that when you go from two to three, things are going better. Now, it, if I did, it gets a little boring, so now I jump to iteration 10. Now notice iteration 10, um, it's, um, they're closer. Now I go to 20, and now the, the orange um, approximation is moving up towards um, the truth. 30, again, it's moving up, and then at 50, it almost is indistinguishable. So we have our nice uh, contraction mapping represented and everything is going nicely. Okay. Now, sometimes things don't go nicely. Now I'm going to ba basically do the same. This is a, this example is a bit different. The production function here is represented, f of x is um, the current capital stock plus some net output. Um, and so we have Cobb Douglas in the net output. <coughs> so this is a slightly different problem. Um, basically the previous one is a problem that people would say has a 100% depreciation. Here we have 0% depreciation. If you think in terms of there being a depreciation factor there. Um, and now then the, the, the coefficient for the Cobb Douglas piece should be um, this in order to have the steady state be equal to one. And the steady state capital stock will then be one and the consumption steady state will be F of one minus one. Now again, we choose utility function so it's defined everywhere. Uh, and also, oops. Okay, yeah, the utility function is defined everywhere. Uh, the production function, I didn't, I didn't do the globalization of the production function um, because it turns out that it wasn't necessary here. Here's the initial value function. Now again, I'm going to specify the same set of uniform grids, etc. And now what happens is I, with this, here's the first iteration of the value function iteration. Um, now notice that here was the initial guess and now here's the next iteration. Well, in this case, what happens is that it's monotonally increasing here, but then it kind of turns flat here, which isn't surprising because the initial guess had actually had it coming down. So um, now then let's go to the next iteration. Oh, no, okay, that was the point, and here's the, here's the polynomial approximation. Now then let's do another iteration. Okay, so it's nice, seems nice. Oh, let's do iteration three. Well, now, now notice going from two to three. Oh, this is like the, you know, in the, you know, in the eye exam where you say two, three, which do you like? Um, that's what this is like. Now notice that when we go from two to three, we're gaining a little convex, con, convex piece here. But, you know, this is going to all wash out, right? Uh, well, wait a minute, that convexity in iteration three created a value function uh, in the next iteration that has an even bigger convexity. Oh, iteration five, ooh, boy, that's not good. Well, well, well you know, oh, iteration six. Well, but you know, contraction mapping, it's gonna save us. The, ex the answer is no, this is, this is, this is unstable, this blows up. This blows up. Now, why did it blow up? It's a very simple reason why it blew up. When I did the maximization problem, I just said maximize this objective, this objective. 
I didn't put in any limits on the tomorrow's state. You see, by choosing to consumption today, you choose tomorrow's capital stock. And I didn't put in this up here, I didn't put any limit on that. So what was go what's going on here is that um, when you're doing, when it was doing these iterations, particularly, um, um, particularly up here is that it, well, in order to get, when it was doing the optimization, choosing consumption, it was doing choosing consumption so low that the capital stock was being evaluated at values beyond the max. And that just gets worse and worse and worse. So the problem is that you, you, you basically have to tell the computer that tomorrow's capital stock, the next period's capital stock, has to be within the domain that we're using for our, to solve the problem. So you have to add this constraint to the numerical problem. Uh, this is because the approximation, you see, you come into this, you say, oh, I'm gonna only uh, uh, solve the value, the dynamic programming problem on this domain, x min to x max, or k min to k max, whatever. Um, but then, when you proceed with value function iteration, you have to make sure that uh, the computational algorithm knows that you're gonna be staying within that domain. So you have to add that constraint. And now what happens uh, when we, we do, do repeat? Now the first iteration has this little convexity here um, with that curve. Um, now, though, what happens is that uh, things don't go bad, though. There's a little convexity here, but it gets tapped, it gets basically tapped down. And so what happens is that it goes away. And you end up with something stable. What was going on back up here is that, yes, it had this convexity thing, but, um, but basically, if you were at 1.2 and you tried to exploit this convexity, uh, you'd be stopped. You could not go beyond tomorrow's capital stock being uh, uh, one, beyond 1.5. So basically that put this under control. And then with that under control, basically the computer was told you can't choose a capital stock above 1.5. And then, then it basically said, oh, okay, then I guess, if I'm at 1.5, I then this save, and then everything is nice and stable. And okay, so what's the lesson here? Well, one thing about approximation is general is thou shalt not extrapolate. When you have a set, a, a set of data points on some domain and you do some fitting of it, some regression, whatever, then you have something that's good on that domain. You don't have anything, any information about what's beyond that domain. Typically what happens when you leave the domain, uh, the interpolant or approximation goes crazy. Um, so you have to keep it inside that domain. All right, so that tells, so what we've seen here now in, in, in these slides is, First of all, you've got to make sure that your utility function is globally defined. You don't want it to try out negative consumption. Um, because if, if utility at negative consumption is not, does not exist, you then have to change utility function so that it does exist. The other thing is you have to add this constraint in here. You have to tell the computer you cannot go outside the bounds of the problem over which we are approximating it. Okay, so now, how, okay, any questions about that? See, this is what I find often that, that I, where I screw up. I get lazy, I don't do the globalization of utility function, or I don't add the constraints, and what happens, uh, maybe it works for a while, then I change something and then it goes bad. The, you just have to get in the habit of always putting down something that is globally defined, 
And then um, also make sure that when you're doing the value function iteration, that you impose constraints so that the state variable for tomorrow's state variable does not go outside the domain over which tomorrow's value function was um, defined. Any questions, comments? Okay. Now, um, now, one way to avoid some of these shape issues is with piecewise linear interpolation. In fact, when I talk with um, labor economists or people working on some simple dynamic programming problems, um, they tell me, or they use piecewise linear interpolation. And when I ask them why, why don't they try these polynomial methods? And then they tell me they don't work. And so then that motivated me to think more, think uh, more deeply about why polynomial methods don't work. Um, they probably would work if you just had a huge number of approximation nodes in a low order polynomial, but, um, but that's inefficient. Now, one thing about piecewise linear interpolation is that if you have a scatter point of dots, that looks concave, then when you do piecewise linear interpolation, uh, the resulting curve will also be concave. And by the way, this basically goes to show you that um, uh, kindergarten actually taught you something. Uh, I, don't, I know nothing about kindergarten, but I have the impression uh, that um, in kindergarten, if you're given a a set of points, then you're encouraged to like draw straight lines between them and then you end up with a function. So um, that is um, what piecewise linear interpolation will do. If you have concave data, it will give you a concave interpolant and you won't have to worry about the bad stuff that went on before. And so basically if you have data for a value function that says that the value function is vi at node xi, then the piecewise linear interpolant is the following, is that if x is in the interval between xj and, and xj plus one, then, uh, then, you, then in that interval, it's, you have this linear, um, uh, function, linear function, and then here are the coefficients. Uh, the bj1 is the slope, and then um, this is all, bj0 is chosen so that at x equals xj, um, when x equals xj, you get, um, you know, what you're supposed to get. Now, the problem with piecewise linear interpolation is that now your value function is not differentiable. So you have to solve, when you're doing the optimization problem, um, the value function is piecewise linear, which means it's continuous but not differentiable. That means you have to use a very slow kind of optimization routine. You may try some N Newton method, but it's gonna complain about how it, um, you know, it may actually work, but after uh, doing a lot of inefficient iterations, and then it'll complain to you about how um, uh, you gave it a nasty problem. Now, here's the little fact about um, concave functions. Oh, do I have, okay, where's, um, oh, whiteboard. Uh, I am. Um, I used whiteboard. Oh. Um. I go. I go do the sharing thing. I think that's share is where I go. Whiteboard. Yeah. Okay. Now. 
Freehand drawing with a mouse, not a good idea. I'll prove that's not a good idea, but it's better than uh, verbally trying to describe this. So suppose you have, uh, your data is like this. And you're doing a piecewise linear interpolation. So that piecewise linear interpolant is going to be a straight line like this here, a straight line, oops. Uh, um, can I? Yeah, okay, good. Straight line here and a straight line there, kind of a straight line. Now, so then basically uh, at here at X1, um, you, this is X1, X2, um, X3, and X4. Now, um, what, so you basically, for any X, you find out what interval it is and you go to the, to the uh, uh, linear piece. Now, there's another way of, of thinking about this. Suppose we take that, um, straight function, and then we stretch it out. We think of it, we think of it as, um, in that way. And suppose we stretch this out also. Uh, anyway. And suppose that this line is stretched in that way. Now, what happens here is that now, so you have these three straight lines. Notice that if you took any X, let's say if you took any, any let's say you took this X, then what you could do is you could evaluate um, all three lines. There's this evaluation, this one, this one, and this one is evaluates up here. Notice that the piecewise linear function is equal to the minimum of these three values. So one way to represent this function is to just say that, well, you take all, all of these straight lines, you evaluate X at all of them, and you take the min. Now you may say, well, is that good? Well, yes, it is. Okay, so that's one way of defining a function, uh, defining a concave function. Um, and so now we're going to go back to uh, slides. So now this is the min function approach to concave W. So now suppose you're at XI. And now instead of putting tomorrow's value function over here, I just say that it's a W, some W. Uh, now I want to maximize this sum. I want to choose A and I want to choose W. So I get to choose tomorrow's value. And I choose tomorrow's state. <coughs> um, but tomorrow's state Y has to be compatible with the law of motion and the action. And then the W that I choose has to be less than all of the, uh, that less than its value at all of the straight lines that are used for the um, piecewise linear thing. So notice, I don't, I don't ever have to decide, okay, what, what interval is tomorrow's state in? No, I just say, I, I, choose tomorrow's state, I choose tomorrow's value, I choose today's action. However, in choosing the value W, I have to make sure that it's below the valuation given by each of these three lines involved in the piecewise linear um, uh, interpolation. So now you might say, well, gee, this looks crazy. No, it's not crazy because now we have a C infinity problem. Suppose that utility function has lots of derivatives and the law of motion has lots of derivatives. And then this is just linear. 
oops, uh, sorry. So these constraints are just linear. So even though I may have added a hundred constraints here, the key thing is that uh, these are very simple linear constraints. Um, it's just a bunch of constraints between W and Y. And most of them are not going to be binding, but only one is going to be binding in the end. And so you can use Newton type algorithms. You could use an SQP, you could use, um, or maybe something else is better, but you could use very fast optimization procedures to quickly give you uh, the solution. And you could also quickly um, give it a, uh, a good initial guess, that'll be fine. So even if you're going to do piecewise linear interpolation, you should not do it directly as an interpolation. You should rewrite the pro optimization problem, and then you can go zip, zip, zip through the problems and, and, avoid, and, and avoid the non-differentiability problems. This is the case so often when you have uh, kinks um, in problems, you can avoid the, um, uh, the non-differentiabilities by just exploiting some reformulation. By the way, um, even if you didn't have a con concave value function, um, there is a way to also avoid the non-differentiabilities, but that's for another lecture. Um, now, so, now, here's, here's an even better approach. By the way, everything I did before so far has been for one dimensional value functions. Now, however, suppose we're in multiple dimensions. The key thing is that in multiple dimensions, you define a convex function by its vertices. And then the set of points in the convex set Y is a set of all little y, which are convex combinations of the vertices. Convex combination means that all these weights are positive, are non-negative, and that they add up to one. Okay, so that's how you define a convex set. Now, suppose you have a concave function, or let's say you want to approximate, you want to have a concave function go through the data. Now suppose that this data is also consistent with there being, uh, being from a concave function. So suppose you have data, x, j, y, j. Now then, how, and I want to do a concave um, linear interpolation uh, for an arbitrary point y. Well, what is that y going to be? Well, what you, it's going to be some value w. And then, um, no, this is for, this is, um, oh, this is for, for, okay, you fix an x and then trying to find the interpolant. So what happens is you say, oh, choose any w you want. However, you must choose weights so that the x is um, in the convex set and has these weights mu. And these weights mu have to add up to one. And so then give, if you have these weights that define the, the X, then what you do is, well, I'll use those weights to compute um, a corresponding uh, value for, um, from the values of, of y. These are, now though, the thing is that there are many solutions to mu's. Basically the x um, points inside a convex set often have multiple ways of, of being represented as convex combinations of points. So now what we do is we want to find the best, the maximum w that's possible. So find that set of weights such that, that are compatible with um, being at point X and adding up to one 
and then you and such that gives you a high the highest possible com convex combination of the y's so this is a concave approximation and then now how do we do value function for um uh, here now suppose that the old value function is represented by a set of nodes and values and so now what we want to do is to get the value at some current xi we choose the little a's um, and given a little a that tells you what the y is tomorrow now the y is a point in tomorrow state space so therefore the y has to be a convex combination of some of the nodes that you used. By the way, this the, these need these need not be these need not be the, for just the vertices. Um, this can be any collection of points. And so then I define the I find some weights such that y is a convex combination of the x plus nodes I used. And then I find the W that is the corresponding weighted sum of the values. And then I find how I, I max over by looking over various A's and mu's, I find the maximum value. And that gives me my value at um, node X today. So this now is also a Notice again, <clears throat> this problem is as smooth as the utility function is and, it's, and the law of motion G. Um, because all of these extra constraints, yes, there may be lots of extra constraints, but they're all linear. And so hence they're all trivial. And so this is a way to do, um, um, basically piecewise linear interpolation in high dimensional spaces. By the way, this is different from multi-linear approximation. Um, this basically is a way of taking a set of points and constructing the, um, and essentially it's the smallest function that is above all the nodes. So, so basically what now, I've never seen this used in economics, but this is one way to go if you have a problem where you know the value function is concave. Um, and so, now in economics, a lot of times you do piecewise linear interpolation, but again, you'd be much better off doing the, uh, the, the version that I showed you. Now, now more generally, we're going to want to stay with smooth approximations to smooth value functions. So now we have to dig, deal with the shape issues. Um, now, so suppose that the theory tells us that the value function is concave and increasing. And the data from value function iteration is consistent with that shape information we then want the approximation of the new value function to incorporate that information and presumably will improve accuracy. Now, as I've said, neither interpolation nor regression preserves shape of data. And why should it? You told the computer, find a curve that minimizes the sum of squared differences. So, um, when it comes back and doesn't preserve the shape and you, you start you know, scolding it, it's going to say, well, you didn't ask me, you didn't tell me about the shape part. Now, here's where it gets mathematically difficult. When you're doing regressions, you're choosing coefficients of the, of the regressors from an arbitrary vector space of, of coefficients, Euclidean, uh, some n-dimensional Euclidean space. So what you're trying to do is you're looking at this data set and then you're looking at all the functions that um, are possible that you could use and it's a vector space of functions. However, once you impose shape, 
you see, the set of all concave functions is not a vector space. Because remember, to be a vector space, um, if you take two functions and they're in your vector space, then the difference of the two functions have to be in that vector space also. But that's not the case. You take two concave functions and you take the difference, you may not be concave. You take a monotone, two monotone increasing functions, you take the difference, you're likely not going to be con monotone. So the problem of finding a good approximation that respects shape information is not a problem in a vector space. It's a problem in a cone. Cones do not have countable bases. That's the nice thing about vector spaces is that you have a basis and then any point in that space can be a linear combination of those basis elements. But we don't have bases for um, uh, to approximate monotone functions or concave functions. The other thing is that shape constraints are infinitistic. When we say that we want a function f to be monotonically increasing, we mean that we want its derivative to be zero, to be positive for all x's between a and b. That's an infinite number of constraints. Concavity also is an infinite number of constraints. So now what we're trying to do is solve a, a maximization problem, you know, like something, minimize sum of least squares subject to an infinite number of constraints. Uh, this is, by the way, called the semi-infinite uh, optimization problem. It's called semi-infinite because you have a finite number of, arc of choice variables, but an infinite number of constraints. Now, what are we going to do? So suppose we have suppose we have data that's at now here we at some z's and v's that's consistent with concavity and monotonicity. This we're back to the scalar world now, and we want to find a Chebyshev polynomial representation with the same shape. Um, so what do we what what do we want to do? Um, so minimizes okay so you see one way to write interpolation problems suppose that we have suppose we're doing interpolation so what we want to do but now interpolation is a set of equations but okay we can do that by an optimization you see we want to find uh the cj coefficients such that the at such a, at each zi the value um, of the Chebyshev polynomial is the VI. So this is your, um, basically your interpolation condition. So this is a, a finite number of, you know, M conditions on the M CJs. So that interpolation normally is just solving this linear set of equations. Well, but now what we're going to do is we want to have that set of equations. We want to choose a CJ so the interpolation is true, but we also want to have the CJs chosen so that um, the, uh, the Chebyshev the approximation is monotone increasing and concave so that the, deriv the first derivative is positive and then the second derivative is negative. And we want to impose that on a finite number of yi's. See, basically, the way you solve semi-infinite optimization problems is you take, you have an infinite number of constraints, and you take a finite subset. Now, you've got to be intelligent about taking that finite subset, but let's just proceed as if we are intelligent. So what you do is you add on some shape constraints. And by the way, the number of points you use for shape constraints are often going to be bigger than the number of points you're using for the interpolation. Now, here's the problem. This is often over overdetermined because you see, the thing is that there is a unique solution to this part. And now if that solution for CJ does not, does not imply also these constraints holding, then uh, there is no solution. Um, so this is a problem where you have uh, not enough degrees of freedom. 
because you have, you're choosing M C coefficients and you have M plus M prime constraints. Not likely to work. So how are we gonna do that? Well, we're gonna add more basis functions. We're gonna add more Chebyshev polynomials. So we're going to allow um, the Chebyshev approximation not to be, um, uh, yeah, we, we, we now allow up to N Chebyshev polynomials in the approximation. And we still want to impose these M interpolation conditions. But now that doesn't necessarily, that just means that out of N coefficients, you have M constraints. You now use, that's actually N plus one condition, uh, coefficients, you have M constraints. So you still have N plus one minus M degrees of freedom. And you're hoping that that's enough then to impose this. Now, uh, but the, how big do you have to get? You don't know. So what you're gonna do is take N to be a big number uh, in order for you to be confident that there is a solution to this. But then, but then if you take it to be a big number, well, now it's underdetermined. There's too many possible Cs that are going to generate something that preserves shape globally and um, gives you this, um, <coughs> gives you the interpolation. So now what do you do? You penalize the higher order elements. You see, if you have M data points, you have to include at least the degree M minus one Chebyshev polynomial. So you have to have C zero to CM minus one anyway. And then you penalize the other ones. And also notice here that the penalty is growing in the index. So J, so when J equals M, this is just one times CJ. When J is uh, M plus uh, one, you know, when J is M plus one, this is gonna be two, so this is four. So what happens is that you're giving um, a bigger and bigger penalty to CJ, uh, which represents a coefficient on a higher order Chebyshev polynomial. So what this is going to do is you, you allow for lots of Chebyshev polynomials to be used, but then you penalize the use of the higher order um, Chebyshev polynomials, which correspond to like the, like the high frequency parts of the approximation. You penalize that. And so in the end, um, you're going to have, I think, I think this will actually give you the minimum number of Chebyshev polynomials such that you have interpolation and shape preservation at these YI nodes. So this is how one has to proceed. You, you, see, you see, you want to do interpolation, but you want to also add more constraints, concavity or monotonicity. Well, now that problem is overdetermined. So then you give the approximation, the, the set of functions used in approximation, you increase that set. Increase it by a lot, but then you might have a problem where you get so many that there are multiple solutions. Then what you do is you penalize the high order elements. Now, why did I do Chebyshev polynomials here as opposed to ordinary polynomials? You see, with you see with Chebyshev polynomials, we we know that you really want to have um, a polynomial with the uh, smallest number of coefficients. And also the Chebyshev polynomials are orthogonal with respect to each other. And so that also helps in terms of making sure that you get the minimal number. Uh, if you had ordinary polynomials, then, uh, then they are not orthogonal to each other. And so this is not gonna be as well behaved a problem. Um, maybe theoretically it could be, but um, computationally, it's not going to be. In particular, um, if you have just ordinary polynomials and high degree ordinary polynomials, then these, then these constraints become very ill-conditioned.
And so you don't want to do that. Um, so you do Chebyshev polynomials if you're in a domain, if a compact domain, um, and then the interpolation equations are, have full rank. Um, and, um, then the, you can add the, uh, shape restrictions and then now you're going to get a, um, solution. Now you might ask, um, well, how do you know you have enough? There are some complicated theorems that say, well, if you know that the function you're approximating has a, a curvature, an upper bound in the curvature, then that can tell you how many nodes you have. Uh, by the way, you don't want to go through that. You don't want to use the theory like that. What you want to do is use computational power. So you throw in lots of ends and, and with lots of shape uh, restrictions and then uh, hope you have a good optimization that can handle that. Um, the problem is that as, the, as you have more and more of these YIs, then these constraints start to having a, a problem with being ill-conditioned. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so, um, but that's, theoretically, there is a finite number of shape nodes that will give you, um, that will be sufficient. Um, however, in practice, um, you, it may not work so well depending on your op solver um, because of some ill conditioning issues here. here. Um, now, I've tried this on Mathematica. I think some, if I do take too many Ys, things don't work well, but that's because I think Mathematica is using an interior point algorithm. I suspect that an SQP would be better here. Why, why do I say that? Well, it's because, by the way, uh, in the computer, this, these constraints should be greater than or equal to. They, sh they should be weak inequalities because you cannot impose um, uh, strict inequalities. So in the computer, you know that very, you're pretty sure that very few of these constraints are going to be binding or active, and SQP is one that does sort of toss out um, uh, inactive constraints. So now, um, now then here's a way to improve um, uh, computational performance. What I do here is I take the pure interpolant. I use that as the in, basically the initial guess. Um, and then I hear what happens is that I then, so I take this, the, I'm optimizing over the CJs, but also CJ plus and CJ minus. And the CJ, is, I want this change, this deviation of CJ from the pure interpolant to be decomposed into a plus minus a minus part. And so, um, oh, for that's for the first M, this is the interpolation part. And then here, um, I, I really want most of these CJs for the higher ones to be um, uh, zero anyway. And so, but I, then I impose non-negativity and the result that this is going to be um, more stable numerically um, because of the uh, decomposition. Um, first of all, you, you have a good initial guess. Um, and so then it's basically just a deviation. You're just trying to solve for the deviation from the first initial guess. And so that's, that's going to help. Um, now, uh, okay, this is in one of the papers I sent you. So here, what we did is we had, um, this was a simple growth model, of, but finite horizon. Yeah, so this is a finite horizon growth model. And what we did is we started with some, um, okay, okay, it's, yeah, we started with some, oh, oh, basically this is finite horizon with some terminal valuation from, now I forget the details about exactly what we did for the terminal valuation function, but um, we um, had some terminal valuation and then we just did value function iteration going back from time so start, you see, basically, uh, I think the problem ended at time 20. 
Um, and then we did value function iteration going backwards to get the value function at time equals zero. Now, what when we ran this, uh, we computed the L infinity errors for consumption. And what we found is that if we did not impose shape, uh, there were significant errors in the L infinity. Uh, in, in there are significant, there is, L infinity means the worst case. So what we found is that there are some states in which the consumption decision was um, not good. We know we can solve the problem, so we know what the, the truth is. And then we did shape and preserving interpolation, and uh, that's the bottom line. And so then the errors are very small. Oh, by the way, okay. This is a deterministic finite horizon problem. We can solve out for the true solution by just do, taking, by doing a finite optimization problem. Um, and so we know what the truth is, so we can tell what the, what the um, errors are. Now here's the L1 errors for consumption. Now notice that, okay, the L infinity errors are quite big, like on the order of 0.1 for many of these iterates. Now the L1 error, the absolute, the, the average magnitude uh, is much smaller, 14 times 10 to the minus three. So that means that most, that for most nodes, this is a very good fit. Um, but even then, shape preservation did significantly better. Um, and then we, this was a, had labor supply also that uh, there were significant L infinity errors, um, but with shape preservation, things were better. So shape, helps. And now here's a problem where um, without, this would go very bad if we didn't have shape preservation. Multi-stage portfolio optimization. So you have wealth at times T, you have a bunch of stocks, you can put your money in, you have risk-free bond. Um, here's your portfolio, um, number of stocks at time T, uh, that's the money in stocks and this is the money in bonds. Here's your wealth at time t plus one. Um, and so here's your uh, multi, what you wanna do is maximize the value of time zero wealth, subject to all of the um, ways you have of getting to time capital T. So here's the Bellman equation. Now, what we did is we actually put in shorting constraints. So that means the bond allocation so when, when wealth is high, uh, you don't want to stick. What, when wealth is high, what you want to do is short the bond market. You want to borrow money and stick it in the stock market. Um, so you're stuck at a corner of zero, uh, whereas otherwise you have a nice linear um, decision. Now then this is uh, T equals five is the terminal horizon. And then, um, then this is, um, Basically, we're solving the problem around initial value, wealth close to like one plus or minus 0.5. But then of course, the thing is that the, the range of wealth increase. And so by the time you're into period three, uh, you could have such high wealth that you, um, yeah, you want to short the short bonds. And there again, when we, without shape preserving, um, uh, so the square boxes, Chevy Chevy interpolation without shape preserving, and then errors for shape preserving, pre preserving with errors, but when you did shape preserving. And what you find again is that uh, the errors in terms of, this is the, the errors on the bond side, like how much bonds do you hold as a fraction of your wealth? And notice that it, every, now here it's, you know, it's, it's basically an order of magnitude um, better to do shape preserving um, approximation. Now this, and, um, and actually notice that, okay, at time equals four, this is a period before the last period. Um, it doesn't matter so much, but as you iterate back to T equals three and then T equals two, boy, shape preservation um, is important in, in, in preserving the quality of the approximation. And that's because if you violate the shape 
in the value function for some future period, you're going to mess up today. <coughs> Why is that? Because remember, portfolio allocations depend on the second derivative of your utility function and the value function. So if you don't impose global concavity and monotonicity, that's going to um, make some, create some convex regions of the value function, which is then going to mess up your portfolio decisions. So uh, this is a case where shape preservation is absolutely essential. Um, also, by the way, I have seen papers where they do piecewise linear interpolation for asset allocation problems. Now, that is a case of where the approximation procedure, piecewise linear interpolation, is absolutely the wrong thing to use. Why? Well, think about piecewise linear interpolation for a value function. That means that what's the risk aversion implicit in such a value function? Well, in parts of the value function where the value function is linear, then the second derivative is zero. So implicitly, you're acting as if you had um, zero risk aversion. At the kink points, the second derivative is infinite. So that means that at those points, you have infinite risk aversion. This is not going to do go well when you're trying to compute portfolio allocations. Now, if you're going to be doing portfolio allocations, you absolutely want to use a smooth kind of uh, approximation for the value function that has a, some chance of representing the true curvature of the utility function and the curvature of the value function, because only then are you going to get reliable solutions for portfolio allocations. But then if you just use ordinary polynomial or even spline approximations, you're going to have shape issues. And so then uh, you have to impose shape preservation. Now, I also sent you a uh, paper of mine with a student from about 20 years ago, where we did some um, uh, shape preserving things. Now that paper don't, that paper is an example of how not to proceed. Um, you see, I have spent a lot of times over the past uh, 25 years looking through the literature on computer graphics, looking for something that uh, would help me in terms of approximations that preserve shape. And now you see, there's an enormous amount of work done in computer graphics. And why is that? That's because of uh, uh, teenage boys um, being obsessed with um, video games. Because you see, if they're gonna be playing, <coughs> they're gonna be playing video games, and they, and a lot of those video games, they have swords and they're fighting um, other people with swords. And so then when, when the sword hits somebody else's neck, then you want to have that blade to be represented to be very sharp. And then also when the blood comes out, you want to have the blood droplets have the right shape. And this also has to be, this has to be done very quickly. So you have to come up with very efficient ways to preserve the shapes of swords and blood droplets, et cetera. Um, the problem is that uh, these, these are pretty complicated formulas for two dimensions, three dimension shape preservation. And the thing is that a lot of times we wanna preserve shape in higher dimensions. And these teenage boys just can't handle more dimensions than two or three. So, you know, the, the graphics, uh, industry uh, doesn't have any interesting things to use for higher order, higher dimension shape preservation. So uh, then that's why then in the past several years, I gave up on all of that stuff and then uh, basically decided to go with this um, semi-infinite approach of where what you do is you over-identify the problem and then penalize the extra coefficients and uh, you write down, yeah, you have an infinite number of constraints, but then you come up with a good finite sample that um, will impose a shape. And this is an idea that goes for all dimensions. The uh, one dimensional shape preservation thing, the two dimensional, by the way, the paper I sent you with this student from about 20 years ago, we found some two dimensional um, approach for shape preservation and it was very slow, very inefficient. 
Um, so this, that's the point here is that you have, you know that your value function is, if you know your value function is nice and smooth and concave, then you show, should go directly to that and use that. Um, in my book, I talk about shoemaker um, poly, um, shape preserving polynomials, and you know that's okay for one dimension, but this is going to be, this is going to be um, also better. So, so anyway, I will now officially end the recording.